Hi guys, this is Brandy, otherwise known as Mystery of Diamonds, and welcome to my channel. If you're new here, hey y'all. Okay, so it's Friday, so I hope y'all are ready for another Forensic Friday. So, I'm really excited. Um, for those of you that are new that don't know what Forensic Friday is, what I do is, on Fridays, and I try to do every Friday, um, I, have, I have missed a few here and there, but um, generally what I try to do is every Friday... The first thing I'll do is I will tell you the solution to the last episode's mystery. Because at the end of every video, uh, a Forensic Friday video, I go ahead and I give you a mystery to be able to solve. And you put it in the comments and you tell me who you think or what you think happened or, or whatever. So what I do on the next one is I tell you the solution to last week's mystery. So if you have not watched last week's mystery and you don't want a spoiler, I'm going to put that in the eye right here. I'll put the, the last episode in the eye. Um, so the first thing I'll do is I will tell the solution to last week's mystery and then I will talk about the next case that I'm going to talk about, the forensic case. Uh, and the forensic case that I'm going to focus on this week is John Benet Ramsey. Um, and kind of talk about the, the case and kind of what happened and uh, what all they found and did and that whole nine yards. Uh, and then after I finish going over the case, then I will give you the next mystery for you to be able to comment in the comment section and tell me what you think happened in that mystery. Okay, so uh, usually what I do is I diamond paint and then I do a voiceover uh, telling of this um, because it's kind of hard to diamond paint and uh, read from the different case file stuff and the mystery stuff. So uh, I hope that y'all are excited. I hope y'all are ready for another Forensic Friday because I am so ready. So here we go into this mystery. All right, so let's go ahead and get the solution to last week's mystery, or not last week's, but the last episode's mystery. So um, this one was a deaf person would not react to ambient noise by raising her voice to compensate for it. Quite likely, Miss Van Nau can hear, and if so, would find it difficult to explain why she did not hear the gunshot that killed poor Alvin while she was supposedly on the porch. So, you know, and it was kind of speculated, you know, was it possible that she was the one that had killed him, you know, or does she know more than what she's letting on? And so, like, they don't really go into that, you know, as far as, you know, do we think that she killed him or does she know what happened? Obviously, we think she knows what happened. She had to have heard the shot because she, you know, the biggest clue that gave it away is that when that noise started up, you know, she winced and then she started talking louder, and she would not have done that if she couldn't hear. Because she would have known that it had started up, and she wouldn't have known to talk louder. Okay, so the case that I'm going to talk about is um, about John Benet Ramsey. Um, and with this case, um, this happened in on December 26th of 1996. Um you know, John and Patsy Ramsey were um, her parents, and John Bonet was um, kind of well known in the beauty pageant uh, world. She was uh, six years old. Uh, she was a child um, beauty pageant queen, and you know, uh, she'd gotten into that because of her mother. Um, Patsy was a beauty queen herself, and so um, you know, she got she got John Bonet into it. And so, uh, on the morning of December 26, 1996, um, when they came down, they found that their daughter, uh, was missing. She wasn't in her bed, um, and, you know, they couldn't immediately find her, and when 
they came downstairs, um, <coughs> Patsy found this ransom note. And the ransom note was demanding $118,000 for their daughter's safe return. Okay, and so, uh, you know, the note said, you know, please don't uh, call anybody, don't involve um, the police or else, you know, she'll die. Um, and so, uh, the police actually got there around 5.55 a.m. Um, to investigate. Now, I do have uh, a copy of the letter that was found. I uh, said, Mr. Ramsey, listen carefully. We are a group of individuals that represent a small foreign faction. We respect your business, but not the country that it serves. Um, at this time, we have your daughter in our possession. She is safe and unharmed. And if you want her to see 1997, you must follow our instructions to the letter. You will withdraw $118,000 from your account, $100,000 will be in $100 bills and the remaining $18,000 in $20 bills. Make sure that you bring an adequate size attache to the bank. When you get home, you will put the money in a brown paper bag. I will call you between 8 and 10 a.m. tomorrow to instruct you on delivery. De delivery will be exhausting, so I advise you to be rested. If we monitor if we monitor you getting the money early, we might call you early to arrange an early uh, delivery of the, and that was, I do have the full letter, but not, um, and they did warn her in, or warn them in the letter, uh, you know, you're a fat cat, and, you know, um, there was like wording that was kind of like from the movies. Uh, some people said that it was a little bit like some of the uh, Dirty Harry movies, and, um the speed movies and stuff, you know, uh, it was just kind of weird worded letter. Um, and so what ended up happening? Okay. So here's the problem. They woke up, you know, they see this, they can't find their child. Um, so obviously, you know, as parents, they get concerned, their friends come over and try to comfort them. The police are there. The police actually allow all of these people to move around the scene and the thing is, is that one of the first things that you do when you are uh, looking at a possible crime scene is to protect the scene and to coordinate off and to preserve uh, any possible evidence that could be found. Um, so anyway, she was instructed not to call the police, but obviously that was one of the first things uh, that she did. But like I said, friends and family had showed up and they were roaming around the house, uh, picking up things, possibly destroying any evidence that was there um, in the house. Um, then they started, the Boulder Police Department started um, sharing some information that they found with the Ramseys. And so they didn't actually conduct their um, formal interview. They did informal interviews. Because see, here's one of the other things is that in the case of like um, a child or actually any murder case just about, they tend to look at the family first. Uh, when it is a child, they most definitely uh, tend to look at the parents first. Um, you know, it's a sad reality that there are parents out there that have and uh, killed their kids. Um, you know, it's, it's a very, very sad fact, but it is true. Um, and so... Um, they kept waiting and they kept waiting because supposedly they were waiting on the, uh, the kidnapper to call. Cause you know, according to the letter, the kidnapper was going to call and was going to leave instructions, uh, as to where to take the money. Now, one of the suspicions about the amount, $118,000 is a really weird number, right? It's not like this, uh, you know, a hundred thousand, 150,000, you know, it, it's really a strange number. And what made it even stranger was that that was the exact amount that John Ramsey, the father, had received as a bonus. Um, you know, so that kind of caused some suspicion. You know, how in the world was the ransom for the exact same amount as the bonus? And, it, you know, and it be some 
not really, I mean, it's an even number, but not like a number that most people would pull out of their head um, as, as an amount, you know, so that was a little bit suspicious. So they were waiting for the call. They're waiting for the kidnapper to call. Um, there's no call and whatnot. And so at about one o'clock PM, um, the detectives instructed Mr. Ramsey and a family friend to go around the house and see if they notice anything missing, anything strange. And of course, when they did that, they went down to the basement, which at that point, the police had not gone down to. The police had not searched the entire house. Nobody had. And so, of course, the father goes down there and he goes into the basement where he finds John Bonet's body. Okay. Um, so what does he do? Does he leave the body there? Does he go upstairs to the police and say, hey, here's, you know, no, he's a father. Hello, this is his child. So he picks up her body. He takes her upstairs immediately and uh, covers her body and whatnot. He tried to take the, because she was found, um, the way that she was found is uh, she was uh, strangled with uh, what they call a garret. Um it was a, a wire that was connected to um, a paintbrush that was found in the house. Um, uh, one of Patsy's, uh, or not a, a wire, but a white cord. And that was used to strangle her. Um, they covered her mouth in duct tape. And her wrist and her neck were wrapped with the white cord. Um, now, they did not find conclusive evidence of uh rape however they um they did find that there was uh some some sexual stuff that had happened to her but not specifically uh rape um and so her actual death was due to asphy asphyxiation due to strangulation plus she also had a skull fracture um so she had been hit in the head um, when they did the autopsy, they did find pineapple, uh, in her system and her stomach, which means that she died shortly after eating because it had not had a chance to process and had not had a chance to come out of the, the body of the system. Um, and they did find a bowl of pineapple in the kitchen. Um, but you know, they, they really didn't find, uh, any other physical evidence anywhere. Uh, when they did, uh, look at the note, they did find that the note was written on paper from the Ramsey's house, and it was written with a pen found in the Ramsey's house. Um, you know, so that was another thing that kind of put suspicion on the parents. Um, and the fact that it demanded the almost the exact amount of money that John had received as a bonus earlier that year. Um, and of course, you know, the Ramseys, they, they didn't want to cooperate with the police because, you know, they'd already, uh, they'd already suspected that they weren't really following up. They were only, like, they weren't even, they tried to say, look, there was an intruder in the house. There had to have been. Um, some of the police had found evidence that there were, that there, there possibly was an intruder because the window downstairs in the basement was broken. There was a shoe print, a, a boot print that none of the family or friends had boots that were um, that make or anything. They found a blood droplet um, there. Uh, I think it was on her underwear. And so there's like a there's a lot of evidence here that could possibly suggest that there was a uh, an intruder. And uh, at the time, they were they were pretty much only focusing on the parents and the brother. They thought possibly that the brother Burke um, was the one who killed her, and so they weren't really looking at all possibilities. Um, they did ask the family members to submit handwriting samples because they wanted to be able to compare their handwriting to the handwriting in uh, the letter. Um, and John and Burke were both cleared of writing the note, but, uh, they couldn't conclusively clear Patsy. Um, but I mean, that was about the only thing that they, that they had at the time. Um, but like I said, even though there was all this other possible evidence, they focused on the parents. Um, and they spent quite a lot of years, um, like two years 
uh, from 96 to 99 still being investigated over and over and over. And then finally, in 1999, uh, Colorado grand jury voted to indict the Ramseys on child endangerment and obstruction of a murder investigation. But the prosecutor could not meet the, because, you know, in order to convict, they had to have um, beyond a reasonable doubt. And they could not get that. So, therefore, they were actually never um, officially named as suspects in John Bonet's murder. Um and like I said, they did have a lot of evidence um, that did support the intruder theory um, and everything. And eventually, uh, the blood that was found was tested. Now, you got to understand that in 1996, 1997, you did not have uh, the level of DNA testing that you have uh, later on. Um so, let's see, um, they had found some other suspects, um, one was John Carr, he was arrested in 2006, because he confessed to accidentally killing John Bonet, um, after he had drugged and sexually assaulted her, but they did eventually dismiss him, um, because there was no drugs in her system, and they couldn't confirm that he was there in Boulder at the time. And eventually, when they did get a DNA match, which they did, they did eventually get a, as far as a DNA profile, um, his DNA did not match. And so, there, you know, that exonerated him. Um, most of the rest of the case information that has come in is still technically actually coming in. Um is focusing on the DNA profile um, that they got uh, from the blood that was on her, um, from in her underwear and on her underwear, uh, and from up underneath her fingernails. Um, and they did put it into CODIS, which is um, the National DNA Database, um, in 2003, but uh, there was no matches found. Then in 2006, um, District Attorney Mary Lacey took over the case, and she agreed that the intruder theory was probably was more probable. Okay, as to what had happened, um, and then in 2008, she released a statement fully exonerating the Ramsey family because um, Patsy, John, Burke, all of them were uh, suspects in the case, or you know. People were saying they were suspects in the case, but by taking a look at the DNA, it exonerated them. And so she actually, um, you know, said sorry and all that. Um, they also, uh, in 2010, they reopened the case because, you know, obviously by this point the case had gone cold. They didn't have any other suspects and whatnot. So in 2010, they reopened the case to look at the DNA samples again, did further testing, and they actually now believe that the uh, sample that was found was not just from one person, but from actually two people. Um, and in 2016, uh, it was announced that the DNA would be sent to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation uh, to use more modern methods to get a even stronger DNA profile of the killer. Um, now, one of the things to keep in mind is that there was a lot of contamination in the scenes um, of the crime. So, you know, that is going to have some bearing on um, is there a possibility of getting a better DNA profile um, with newer equipment. Okay, and so that's kind of what they're looking at. Then in 2016, CBS aired... The case of John Bonet Ramsey and implied that her then nine year old brother Burke was the killer. Um, like they didn't come out and say it, but they did imply it. And so her brother Burke, you know, at this point, an adult, uh, did file a lawsuit um, against them. And then in 2019, that lawsuit was settled because um, he, he filed it for defamation of character. Um, and it was. Even though, like, not the full amount was disclosed as to what the, but there was a settlement that uh, was agreed to uh, by all parties. They, um, there was another one that stated that uh, 
one of the people who was around the Ramsey house um, was um, a suspect, but that the uh, DNA uh, excluded him or, you know, uh, exonerated him. The problem is I'm trying to, if you give me just a second, I'm trying to find the uh, name is last like Oliver. Um, so sorry. Okay, so there was a uh, detective, um, Smith, that was investigating the case, and he, he did not want to let it go because, you know, he, 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 it was actually his dying wish that this case end up being solved. Now, he did end up dying of colon cancer um, in 2010, and his daughters helped to take over the case and kept trying to narrow down the, the suspects on a specific list. Um, and one of the names was Gary uh, Oliva, which was a homeless man that frequented a church less than two blocks from the home. And he had actually told a friend right after the murder, like um, that uh, during a phone call, that he had just killed a little girl. Um, he had wrote a letter to a friend of his stating that um, he had killed her. But, once again, they cleared him um, because they couldn't connect him to the crime scene. Um, they had a lot of different people. They're still possibly uh, looking at more and trying to narrow it down. Um, they have a list that in September 2020 uh, was presented to have uh, a list of the top 20 suspects in the case. But, um, his... Daughters, Smith's daughters, don't believe that they are actively uh, investigating the case, um, but they are still continuing. They are to uh, try to look at any way that they can um, help to find the killer. So there's a lot that it's not... It's not solved. It's an unsolved case. There are people out there that are still to this day trying to uh, get as many pieces as they can to put together. The problem is when you, you only have so much time and so much effort um, or so much time and so much evidence when you first investigate a scene. And when you have a scene that was as contaminated um, as this scene was, it was not preserved. Um, the body was moved. Uh, everything, things were touched. Things were moved. Um, things were taken away. That even when you're looking years now, your problem is, is with so much contamination of the scene and of the evidence that when you're trying to look at it years down the road, it doesn't have as much of the validity as it could have if the scene. That's why they tell you you have to preserve the scene, um, which they uh, had failed to do. And so I think that's one of the reasons why this case has not been solved is because of how badly it was handled at the get-go, at the very beginning. Okay, so that is the case of John Benet Ramsey. So are you guys ready for your next mystery? Okay, so remember, I'm going to read you the mystery, and you're going to comment in the uh, comments below what you think happened. Okay, are you ready? So here we go. It was not just the smell of lawyers' offices that bothered him. Jeff Dilly decided as he looked around the library. To be honest, there really was no smell anyway. These offices just seemed musty because of all those stacks and stacks of law books. What bothered him, Jeff realized, was the overwhelming importance of everything, starting with the books. That many books simply looked important. 
Then there were the secretaries. They always seemed so crisply efficient and important. The furniture was important, too. Thick and solid and ordered, like the books. Then there were the lawyers themselves. They behave like high priests, Jeff muttered aloud. Jeff Dilly, private investigator, had worked himself up to the point of walking out of the library and chucking the whole thing. When the door swung wide at the urgent bidding of F. V. Douglas Doyle, barrister, solicitor, notary public, and senior partner of Doyle, Feldstein, and Speranzi. Jeff was just beginning to conclude that it was his imagination which had made the door open more majestically than an ordinary door when Doyle spoke. You're Dilly then, right? No hello, no greetings, no preliminaries, just a confirmation of identity. Jeff felt a bit like a hostile witness. Well, two could play that way, and he had been going to leave anyway. It was you that called me. My name is in your appointment book. Jeff felt he'd scored a small point. Doyle peered over his glasses. Yes, but it was not my idea. Not at your fee, anyway. My fee? Jeff almost came out of his seat. He knew he was the most expensive private investigator in town. More than one potential client had had a change of heart after the first discussion of daily rate and expenses. On the other hand, the reputation of Doyle, Feldstein, and Speranzi, although one of excellence, was also one of high fees and extreme parsimony to boot. My fee, Jeff repeated. Look, if there's going, gentlemen, please. The soft voice commanded attention. It was my request to involve you, Mr. Dilly. My name is Ben Paul. From behind F. V. Douglas Doyle, a tall, graying man held out his hand to Jeff. I'm told you're the best in the field. I asked Mr. Doyle to bring you in. Doyle took a seat and began talking as though nothing at all had happened. Jeff realized why the man was so good in court. Mr. Paul here is being sued. The case is wrong. It's crooked. It's trivial, and it should be thrown out. He paused uncomfortably. We just can't find the weak spot in the other safe. He looked at Ben Paul, as yet. I was rear-ended last spring on a country road, Ben Paul explained in his soft voice. A young man on a motorcycle hit me when I slowed to let a duck lead her little ones across the road. The young man was going very fast. When he hit me, he catapulted right over the top of my car. He was hurt very badly. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Jeff was shaking his head. First of all, I don't do traffic. Uh, too messy, too piddly. And everybody lies. Secondly, if he hit you, wouldn't you be, shouldn't you be suing him? I've advised my client to countersue, Doyle intervened. At the very least, we can delay the thing a year or more. Ben Paul continued in his soft voice, Mr. Dilly. It's not quite that way. You see, I'm being sued for a half a million dollars over and above my insurance coverage. The young man has two witnesses who will swear that I stopped abruptly and with no reason. That makes me the cause of the accident. Well, did you stop that way or not? Dilly wanted to know. Mr. Paul slowed, Doyle stated in his court voice. He slowed because of his laudable commitment to wildlife preservation. He did not stop abruptly. The young man is lying, Ben Paul said in his quiet, authoritative voice. Jeff Dilly saw what a powerful team these two would make in court. Doyle, with his declamatory, stenatorian style, contrasted with Ben Paul's mellow but earnest sincerity. His witnesses are lying, too, Ben Paul continued. They're all family. Cousins by marriage, I think. Hence, the police report. Doyle handed it to Jeff, who began to skim the summary. Lake Erie Division, June 10th, 9.05 p.m. Concession 9 at Side Road. You can read it later, Doyle said. Everything's there. The problem is simply the witnesses. If we can shake them, he frowned in thought. Remember that hot, muggy spell early last summer? You see, we were sitting out front. It happened almost in front of them. I've been there. 
They have a clear view of the road from their little front yard, but only right in front of the place. Then Paul continued, in fact, three seconds earlier or later, and they would not have been able to claim seeing anything because there's swamp on either side of their farmhouse right up to the road and big willow trees too. Jeff pursed his lips. How come you're so sure they're lying? Doyle pulled his glasses farther down his nose and held Jeff Dilly with the look that had writhed so many a witness. Because my client is telling the truth. Then he softened. Besides, yeah. their spill is too pat, too rehearsed. They're lousy actors. Yeah. Even an amateur can tell they're using a script. And you need they some way to crack the shell in court, Jeff added. I need to get it back. Right, Doyle responded. Just one you simple just, thing. Did you just throw it in here? With amateur liars, you only need a nudge and they'll roll right away. He paused. What? Oh, crap. That's you mean you got, got something? Jeff Dilly smiled. Yes. Do you want it? At my fee? So what weakness has Jeff Dilly been able to detect in the witness's story? Do you think you can figure it out? If so, let me know in the comment section. Okay, so back to the original video. Okay, well, I think this is where I'm going to leave you. I hope that you enjoyed the case of John Benet Ramsey, and I hope that you are interested in being able to solve our mystery. You need to let me know in the comments below, what did you think happened? Are you ready to solve the mystery? So I really hope that y'all have enjoyed this. And if you did, please hit that thumbs up button down below. And if you're new here and you haven't subscribed to my channel, I would love for you to subscribe to my channel and become part of the Diamonds family. Well, if, oh, also, if you do, make sure you hit that uh, note bell icon for all notifications so that you'll know whenever I upload a video or go live. And I usually go live on Mondays at 7 o'clock Central. Well, I'm going to leave you like I always do. Reach for the stars, grab hold, hold on, and never let go. Until my next video, bye guys.